Well, welcome back. We're in part two of leadership standards. And now we want, what we want to do is take a look at the actual behaviors. I mean, we're just going to get really super practical. Like if a leader behaves this way, this would cause us to ask them to step out of leadership. And by the way, I just want to frame this. If a leader falls, if a leader stumbles, our heart is always to love them, always to help restore them, help minister God's life, God's healing to them. So it's not a holier-than-thou club, but when we stumble at some of these areas, not only does it hurt our relationship to God, but it also typically, at, at the kind of things I'm going to talk about, it, it hurts those that we're leading because it's a crack and sort of a, a character that, that involves our integrity. And so many times we need to step away from leadership in those moments. We need to get God's healing, God's restoration. We need to reestablish some foundations, some accountability structures, some relationships that will help us uh, rebuild our life. And then, um, then we're really excited to see people step back into leadership at some point in the future. Now, depending on what kind of stumble or fall it is can depend on what kind of future your, your, your future might look different based on certain behaviors and activities. But nonetheless, God always wants to restore and bring us a new beginning. So let's just kind of jump into this. Um, I think one of the big areas in our culture today that is so dysfunctional is just the whole arena of our sexuality. And I think with the advent of the 60s sexual revolution, kind of threw out sexual mores and, and taboos and kind of have really been more of a culture that said, hey, almost anything goes. I would, I would guess that probably, probably most of the mainstream culture would say, you know, sex between two people that love each other, even if they're not married, is okay. If you're in a committed relationship, probably it's okay. Um, if you're in a committed relationship, you shouldn't be having sex with other people. But if you're not in a committed relationship, it might be okay to have sex with many people as you want until you're in a committed relationship. I mean, these are the kinds of behaviors. And then uh, same-sex sex and all these issues are kind of hit the table. So we like to really take it back to Scripture and look and see what Scripture says are about these kinds of standards. Notice in 1 Timothy, when it talks about men, we actually believe that men and women can be in leadership, but when it speaks to a married man, it says a, a married man should be the husband of one wife. We can also uh, infer into this that, uh, that he should only be having sex with one woman, right? And so really, as you study the Old and New Testament, God's standard for sexual behavior is between a man and a woman that's married. And so, you know, God's standards for sexuality are hard for all of us and I think we all uh, want to strive toward that and we, we really want our leaders to walk that out and to and to emulate that for everybody so we we have what we call the Ten Commandments and it's kind of meant to be a little bit of a, a tongue-in-cheek thing but we actually take it seriously and this came from uh, Rick Warren's church Saddleback Community Church I got this probably 20 some years ago and really started teaching this to the leaders of our church from day one. And we ask that our leaders at Vineyard Church live by sort of this set of Ten Commandments. Now, this first set I'm going to go through really applies to married people. But then I'll hit singles. And then I'll hit those who, who, who actually wrestle with maybe a, a gay orientation as well. So the first... Uh, the first of the Ten Commandments is thou shalt not visit the opposite sex alone at home. Some of these are just plain common sense. But uh, don't, don't uh, get yourself in a tempting or vulnerable situation. We, we basically practice uh, the deal where if we need to meet with somebody of the opposite sex, that we do it in an open public area where other people can see us. We can still have private conversations but we don't go behind scenes and behind closed doors and in people's homes and meet with them. Number two, thou shalt not counsel the opposite sex alone at the office. What I typically do is, is I'll meet once and hear what's going on. Uh, even that first time appointment will be in a situation where there's a window and people can see in and all that kind of stuff. I don't ever meet somebody up alone. 
uh, where we're just isolated. And then what I usually do is refer. And so I get uh, a lady who needs further counsel in a situation where she can have a female counselor. Number three, thou shalt not counsel the opposite sex more than once without that person's mate. Refer them, and that's basically what I just stated. Number four, thou shalt not go to lunch alone with the opposite sex. So I often tease a little bit because I have a mom and a mother-in-law and three sisters and a few nieces in addition to my wife and immediate family members. There's many times when I, when I would do things with immediate family members like that. But otherwise, um, I, don't, I don't even drive in the same car with a lady alone. I don't go to lunch with the same, with a lady, you know, with, if I need to, I'll, I'll make it tease. I say I'll make it a threesome, all right? So uh, uh, I'll invite a third party into this kind of situation if we need to have lunch or something like that. Number five, thou shalt not kiss any attender on the, uh, of the opposite sex or show affection that could be question. So just be mindful of your, your, your behavior. You know, lots of times we'll do hugs, but I kind of do the side hug thing. But I'm just careful about uh, just the way we treat each other. Number six, thou shalt not discuss detailed sexual problems with the opposite sex in counseling. Here's an interesting thing. They've done statistics on uh, adultery in the workplace. And since, and since women have entered into the workplace, which is a wonderful thing, it has also escalated the adultery in America. I mean, it has blown it out uh, the, uh, of all proportions compared to what it was before women entered the workplace. What they found is that if you log X number of hours, it's quite a few hours, but if you log X number of hours one-on-one -on -one with, with the opposite sex, somebody particularly you're attracted to, the chances of you having an adulterous affair with that person incrementally go up to the point where, I, I mean, it gets like over 80% chance. And so it's really fascinating how when we form emotional bonds, how then that, can, then that can become sort of sensualized. And what's interesting is in the church world, you know, I can preach a message on a weekend, and I can, I, because, because God's Spirit is working, and I'm working with the Scriptures, I can touch a lady in a deep place in her heart that is God's work, right? And because I was the, the vehicle that God was using, uh, she can open up to me in an area where she's touched by God's work that's maybe an area she's never shared with anybody else, maybe not even her own spouse. And so what the point I'm making is that the holiness of what we do in ministry and the way we touch people at the deepest place of their hearts can actually be a vulnerability. I mean, it's a wonderful thing, but we have to be mindful about how intimate that space is and how the enemy can use that to then build illegal sort of emotional bonds that can ultimately lead to adultery. And so we have to, we have to be careful about that kind of thing. And what we find is that most people have a, emotional affairs before they have physical affairs. So we call it it's emotional adultery. And many times this happens when we share around, like, oh, I'm having a problem with my wife. Oh, I'm having a problem with my husband. And then we meet each other as we try to console each other's bad marriages. But then in the process of doing that, we're building an emotional bond that can lead us down the path to adultery. So we really have to guard against this. And, and the, the other area that I found, this is probably more true with men, but it's happening with women now even more because of online pornography and chat rooms and all this kind of stuff. Um, sometimes sex isn't about, isn't about a relationship. Sometimes sex is an addiction. And so um, I've counseled with men who have slept with hundreds of escorts, literally. I've, I've talked with women who have had online sexual encounters through Skype and video things with dozens of men. Um, but they don't actually have a physical relationship with them. Uh, it's literally about sort of an addictive high that they get from sex. So it's not an actual emotional relationship, but it's more of an addictive pattern. And so sex can be an addictive pattern too, which is, which is another issue that, that you need to build accountability. So uh, number seven, thou shalt not discuss your marriage problems with an attender of the opposite sex. Number eight, thou shalt be careful in answering 
cards, letters, emails, text messages, all of that kind of stuff, Facebook messages with the opposite sex. Number nine, thou shalt make your assistant or your friend or somebody you work with your protective ally. I always sit down and go through these things with my assistant, with other people that I work with, so that everybody understands where we're at and we work off the same page. And then number 10, thou shalt pray for the integrity of your other leaders. We want to pray for each other's integrity. So we want to have a church where people can come and really encounter the life of Jesus, really encounter character change, and where our leaders are really modeling an honesty and an integrity of walking with Jesus. So um, I ask all leaders, if you're married, to follow these Ten Commandments. Now here's the deal. If you're in the work world, you're going to have to make your own choices out there in the work world. But I would highly recommend all the businessmen that I meet with, many of these guys travel out of town. What I've found is that traveling out of town can be a vulnerable place. It's not uncommon for men on business trips out of town to hit strip clubs and have affairs and all this kind of stuff, online pornography. So I recommend that you even build into accountability this kind of dynamic into your business life, into your travel life, all that kind of stuff where you really guard your marriage, protect your marriage. It's worth guarding because it's a treasure that God has given you and it's a lifelong commitment that God wants you to keep up. As far as singles go, obviously uh, some of these things change with singles. We're not against dating. Uh, We're happy for singles to meet and date, and I love it when people meet in the church and get married in the church. But our standard is still um, uh, sex is for a man and a woman who are married. And so we ask our singles to remain celibate until marriage. Obviously, if you're single, um, that would be an area where you'd have to, if you blow it in this area, you just have to be honest and, and come clean. And I know that that's a big step, but, but we really would ask that you build the kind of relationships that will help you maintain purity. I know when my wife and I were dating, we both lived in apartments down in uh, Waco, Texas. And we were uh, dating for a year, engaged a year, so it was a two-year period of time that we were really in love and yet wanted to wait till we got married uh, for, uh, for our for our consummation of our marriage. And so we would literally have dates just in semi-public places. We wouldn't go into each other's apartments when roommates weren't there. We would always kind of date in, in open semi-private areas, you know, in restaurants and corner of a library, different things like that. But it was just a commitment that we had to maintain sexual purity. And so I really want to encourage you singles for that. And I'd also encourage you singles who are dating to build accountability into your dating relationship and have an accountability partner, maybe a married couple that will hold you guys accountable, that will pray for your purity and that kind of thing. All right. Um, Also, as far as singles go, we would ask that you not do one-on-one meetings with a married person of the opposite sex, right? So it's still the same standard would hold toward your activity with a married person. Finally, I just want to mention, too, with our culture, in the arena of in the arena of homosexuality, you know that's been a big cultural issue. Obviously, it's kind of a hot button issue. As we read Scripture, both Old and New Testament, we really see that there's a pretty solid line from the moment of creation, God made man and woman, all the way to uh, Paul's teachings in the New Testament, to where really sex is to be for a man and a woman. So we, we understand I don't want to go into all the kinds of factors that would uh, go into homosexuality. Why is there homosexuality? Why do some people have a, have a homosexual orientation? Uh, that's kind of for another class and another time. But let's just suffice it to say that, um, uh, that if people even feel like they have that orientation, uh, we, would, we would ask that they remain celibate as a commitment unto the Lord. And um, we would allow people to be in leadership who make that kind of commitment, uh, regardless of sort of what their orientation is. Uh, We were going to love anybody. We're certainly not out. We're going to extend God's grace to people anywhere in terms of no matter what they're going through, right? So there are places that people can connect and serve. But in terms of leadership and where we lay hands on leaders, we are holding to a biblical standard there, to God's high standard for sexuality. Let me just mention as well addiction like alcohol and drug addiction. 
This is a big one. Um, notice that the, the, new, the Timothy passage talked about not being addicted to much wine. So evidently addiction is a pretty big issue as far as self-control is concerned. So we kind of have a one-year sobriety thing. If you're coming out of alcohol addiction, drug addiction, or even sexual addiction or sexual behavior what we, uh, that, that's, that's, that's inappropriate, what we ask is that you go through a one-year sobriety. And if you get counseling and get healing and there's one-year sobriety under your belt in any of these areas, sexual area, addiction, drugs, alcohol, those kind of things, then we will move people back into leadership and restore them into leadership. But we are looking for one-year sobriety in these kinds of areas. And so this is kind of you know, how we look at certain kinds of behaviors. Let's, let's just take, for example, let's say if you're married and you're going through a marriage difficulty. Um, we really take those cases on a step-by-step basis. Obviously, we're for marriages. We want marriages to stay together. Um, there are some situations where a married couple is going through separation, looks like they're headed toward divorce, one person's in leadership, or maybe both are in leadership. And there's been times when we feel like the best action for them would be to step out of leadership and to really just work on their marriage and focus on that and rebuild their marriage. And so there'd be times when we would ask a couple to step out of leadership in order to work on a marriage or work in some area of their life and get that uh, under God's grace, under God's healing, and kind of rebuild that area of their life. On the other hand, there have been some cases where um, we really feel like one person has done everything they can do and they've done it in a godly way. And we've just seen times when a spouse just says, I'm going to blow God off, I'm going to blow you off, I'm going to blow my family off, and I'm out of here, you know. And, and the person who's, who's in leadership is doing everything they can to try to rebuild that marriage. In some of those situations, we might not remove a person from leadership just because we feel like uh, they're honoring God and doing everything they can to, uh, to make it work. And so those are kind of case by case. So we don't necessarily uh, have a set pattern where we deal with those kinds of issues. So another, another area that we uh, deal with quite a bit is we have a lot of couples, about 70% of couples today live together before they get married. That's kind of a nationwide statistic right now. We found that as we reach out to people wherever they're at, that statistic as people come toward us kind of probably holds true in our own church context. And so um, we, 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 we will, you know, people can come to the church. They can even serve in areas if they're living together. Some couples have already had kids, all that kind of stuff. But when it comes to leadership, as people respond to God, as they respond to Christ's love, as they begin to turn over more and more of their life to Jesus, We've seen that some of our couples that are living together begin to feel like God's calling them in leadership. Well, we'll always ask that couple to make the marriage commitment and to honor God in that way and to take that step of, of faithfulness before God and witnesses and become one flesh. Another area that we deal with a lot is pornography addiction. And, and with the proliferation of the Internet and online porn, and it's a multi-billion dollar industry, what we found is that even homeschool kids where parents are doing their very, very best to try to sort of shield their kids' world from that life, that I've even found that even the, even the homeschool kids are bumping into porn on their, on their cell phones or on their laptops or on their iPads or whatever it is, and, it's, and they're getting exposed to it. And so um, what we really want people to do in this area is just be honest and build accountability. And so um, there are some resources that we've also recommended around this. You've got to be very careful about this one, but triplexchurch.org is one website where you can actually have your accountability partners get a readout on every website that you visit. Uh, Pure Eyes, is that another one? Pure Eyes, I think. Is, it, is that what it's called? Covenant Eyes. Covenant Eyes is the other one. Covenant Eyes. Um, and so really we want people to be accountable and to build the kinds of, of accountability structures into their life where they are, they are, you know, they're eliminating those sources of, of temptation. All right? There have been some, there, there have been some really uh, out-of-control pornographic addictions where we'd ask somebody actually to step out and get a year of sobriety. But um, for the most part, what we're saying is, hey, be accountable 
and 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 be transparent and have your have have a partner there that you're you know accountability partner that you're working with. So I mentioned that money, sex, and power are kind of the big ones. Uh, you might think, well, what what would be an area in the power arena? Well, there can be ways that people can relate to people that they're leading in manipulative ways, maybe through anger, through guilting, through just poor people skills. And there can be times when those things can be bad enough to where we might have somebody step out of leadership and work on their people skills, work on the way they relate to people, the way they lead people, because, uh, because they're misusing the influence and power that they have. So that would be an example there, of like using anger, guilt, manipulation in leading people. Could be an area where we'd ask somebody to step out. Another example is the money issue. At this level of leadership, we're really asking everybody to be committed to tithing, that they're faithful and they're giving, that they've got a good handle on their financial circumstances, that they're not in excessive debt. And so... Um, so giving and managing money well is a big one. Financial Peace University is our main resource there. If you've not gone through that, we really challenge you to do that, get your finances in order. And really at the leadership level, we want people uh, being generous and modeling generosity, tithing, and giving. So these are some of the ways that we slice this pie that we call leadership standards. And so you know, we could, we could debate about the application of all these points, but I think if you take sort of the, the spirit of the New Testament and the leadership standards there from 1 Timothy chapter 3 and other places, what you're going to find is that a, a leader in the church has a good relationship with God, a growing, vibrant relationship with Jesus. They're not perfect. None of us are. We've all blown it along the way. But even as leaders, if we blow it, we want to humble ourselves. We want to ask for forgiveness. We want to then make appropriate amends as God leads us. Then there's relationship with others. We have healthy, good relationships with others. If we have conflict, we deal with it in a godly way. You can refer to the conflict talk that we did on that one in terms of how we go about dealing with conflict. In terms of relationship to other vineyard leaders, we want to treat one another with respect. Our leadership core really backs one another. We really have each other's backs. We really see ourselves as a unified team. And so we're not ever undermining each other or talking behind each other's backs. We're dealing with each other in, with integrity, support, love, care. And if we have an issue, we're going to talk to each other about it. And then that relationship with oneself, that we're free from addiction and really healthy in our family relationships. So that's kind of the spirit of sort of the standards that we see in the New Testament for leaders in the New Testament church. We're thankful that you have stepped into leadership. We're thankful that you want to even begin to help raise up other leaders in the church. It is a noble calling. It is a calling that uh, makes impact for eternity and that will touch people's lives uh, forever. And so we're thankful for you and for your commitment to uh, serving in leadership and learning to even raise up leaders for the kingdom of God. So I want to encourage you now to go to your ministry interactive time with your group.